Okay. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bowman. I'm first and foremost a hobbyist developer. I've also been a teacher, a preacher, a web developer, an IT director, a software project manager, and now I write SQL all day at Cargus. Cargus is the most humane and thoughtful place I've ever worked in technology, and I'm proud to be there. So talking about things I'm proud of. I'm also proud of other things. I use Vim. I'm proud of that. I like Linux. I'm pretty good with Python. I'm pretty good with Bash. I'm proud of those things. I'm getting better with Rust. Not maybe enough to be proud of yet, but I'm, but I'm hoping. Today I'm sharing with you about PowerShell, and I wouldn't say I'm ashamed of PowerShell, but it isn't in my list of things I'm necessarily proud of, which maybe I just need to be a little more circumspect about. It does not usually occur to me to brag about it, but I have grown to a place where I have to say I like PowerShell. You ever just use a language and at the end of the day you're like, that was, that was fun, I enjoyed, I enjoyed my day. I feel that way about Python, I'm getting to feel that way about PowerShell. I'll even recommend it for a variety of use cases. And I genuinely enjoy working with the syntax. I don't know that I will convince you to use PowerShell today, maybe. I don't think I'm gonna even try to, but I do hope you might leave here with at least a renewed eagerness to engage the shell, the command line shell, whatever that might mean to you in your context. Uh, if you wanna, there's a lot of links in here and there's some slides I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but they might have interesting links if you actually are gonna, uh, you know, wanna look into PowerShell a little bit. That's all, the whole slide deck is at ps.bowmanjd.com, which is the QR code. Um, there's a companion GitHub repo, which isn't terribly interesting, unless you're interested in how I built the slides. Um, and then my other contact information, uh, feel free to reach out anytime you have uh, questions that I may or may not know the answer to. It'd be fun to engage you. I'm also on the Tech Langster Slack and trying to be more uh, frequent there. Here's the itinerary of what I'm talking about this evening in the various sections. So uh, this is what we have in store for us. I'm just gonna start with some basics. What is a shell? Just to be different, I thought that instead of showing you an XKCD comic, I would just show you the alt text. <laughs> to make the point that shells have a reputation, as is shown here, uh, of being intimidatingly complex. Possibly the most popular shell today is Bash, or maybe it's Z shell because that's so prevalent on Macs. These shells have been around for a few decades, and the tools that you might use along with them could have been around for even longer, like grep and, and so on. When such an ecosystem evolves over time, it can get to be somewhat complex and intimidating. So I'll bet at some level, at some level, all of us are script kiddies when it comes to shells. Uh, you find something online, you paste it in, if it works, great. But maybe you don't know why. And if that's as advanced as you get with your shell, you're not alone. We're all just trying to dabble and trying to wade in or dive in. But let's not get too intimidated or immobilized. Let's wade in and let's start simple. So the shell is glue. Minimally, it helps you navigate file systems and it helps you get content into and out of files and some other things. So there are many shells and one of them is PowerShell. You might be surprised at how similar <laughs> basic operations look between PowerShell and other shells. You might be surprised too that PowerShell works fine as a Linux shell as demonstrated here. You did just see that, right? The, okay, good, I was like, <laughs> it's different then, okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the difference between a shell and a terminal again, just starting with some basics so we can have some common language. A terminal, I know it's a terminal emulator, and I just learned today on Slack, as some of you may have, that Joshua is quite the connoisseur of actual terminals, not just terminal emulators. When I say termi terminal, I really just mean the emulator. So GNOME terminal, terminal iTerm2, um, Alacrity, whatever, whatever you happen to use. Oh, what's the big one that's been on uh, Slack lately? Um, Ghosty. Ghosty is a terminal emulator, but we'll just call them terminals. It's a device or a software application that wraps the shell. So here's some examples on the left, you got, you know, terminal or the third party tool, iTerm tool, Windows terminal. If you're on Windows, I would strongly encourage you not just to launch the PowerShell or the CMD window, but which is Conhost, which is an old XP style, but the newer Windows terminal, which behaves like one might expect a terminal to behave. GNOME terminal, console, Xterm, RxVT on Linux and BSD. Um, some newer, newer ones, uh, Kitty is one of the more, uh, you know, one of the newer GPU enhanced accelerated terminals. 
Uh, warp is, is new, as is Ghosty, which isn't even out. On the right, you have terminals that work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Alacrity, WesTerm, Hyper, ExtraTerm, Tabby. I'm sure there's plenty more. It's a crowded ecosystem. But none of these are the shell. These are the pretty things that allow you to have a shell in the midst of them. So a shell is an interpreter that provides a command line interface for operating systems. So examples, Bash, Z shell, TC shell, Omquist shell, Corn shell, those are some oldies, but goodies. Um, if you run Mac, you probably, when you launch terminal, you probably have Z shell. If you run Linux, it's probably Bash, or maybe it's Z shell. If you live on the front of the bell curve, you might use one of the ones on the right, like Fish, or New Shell, or maybe even PowerShell. So, a shell is not just an interactive interpreter, but that's how often we use it, but it's also a scripting language. It's trying to be both those things. And here's just a quote from the 1984 book by Kernighan and Pike. Although most users think of the shell as an interactive command interpreter, it is really a programming language in which each statement runs a command because it must satisfy both the interactive and the programming aspects of command execution. It is a strange language. Okay, so I have to say that before introducing PowerShell. Any shell language is a strange language shaped as much by history as it is by design. In other words, it, gets, it accrues things over time. The range of its application leads to an unsettling quantity of detail in the language, but you don't need to understand every nuance to use it effectively. So, some good encouragement there. Again, wade in or dive in, take your choice. When we use a command line shell, it is easy to think that all the tools we're using are baked into the shell, like grep and other things. But actually, in a Unix, Mac, BSD sort of shell, Typically, what's part of the shell is CD, that's how you change a directory, or LS to show the contents of a directory, echo to output something, um, help or man, print the working directory, all that. There's a lot of other tools you might think of as belonging in a shell, but typically, they are not baked into the shell. In other words, you can swap out your shell for anything and still have cat, grep, tail, head, more, less, those are pagers that let you space through things, sed, awk, vi, if you're into those kinds of things. Rip grep if you're more trendy, whatever. So there's all these tools that if you switch to PowerShell, you're still going to have those tools if you're on Linux or Mac. That's both a benefit and a problem. So I love the personalization of mixing and matching tools. But on the other hand, when it comes to sharing scripts with your coworkers or friends, which is something you do with, can do with shell scripts, how do you know which grep your friends have? There are different greps. There's BSD grep and the GNU grep. And on, on the other hand, if you look at shells like PowerShell or New Shell or Conch, they're more of like a kitchen sink included. They're like Python, but tailor-made for, for uh, shell interaction. So that's an advantage, because you can give someone a shell script in that language and have it all for you. But the disadvantage is and that's a future maintenance burden for that project. So you decide which you like better. Some philosophy, why do we need another shell? Um, why another new shell? PowerShell came out in 2006, so it's almost 19 years old already, so that's not terribly new. But let's engage the question anyway. Let's talk about option fatigue. Do you ever get option fatigue when you enter the cereal aisle in the grocery store? The number of choices are wearying. So it's natural to question if we really need more choices. Why make another, I've often heard this question posed about Python web frameworks. Do we really need another one? But it could also be asked of shells or other important matters. <laughs> actually, actually one, of my, one of my close Middle Eastern friends says, chocolate hummus hurts us. And he says it in sincerity, and I have to agree with him. But anyways, if we were just asking this question, not of hummus, but of windows, like why do we need another shell, I feel like, sorry, just put, to be a little, maybe a little gatekeeping here, but the answer is clear. C the CMD prompt, the command prompt, is not great. Um, but let's get a little philosophical for a moment. So why another shell or whatever? Um, people create new tools that scratch a necessary itch. I'd hate to stifle that, right? Why? Have you ever made a new web framework in Go or Python or a language that it's fairly easy to do with? It's terribly fun. Give it a shot. This is super more ideological, but I don't do, do monopolies and hegemonies and consolidation, do they really serve people well, or is there something to be said for foment, for creative divergence, and for experimentation? And when faced with myriad choices, it's okay to stick with one thing without needing to try all the others. In other words, if you find another shell overwhelming, 
Maybe you just want to stick with Bash. That's okay. I think JavaScript developers have learned to function this way or they'd be constantly paralyzed or distracted, right? You, if you know you like cinnamon life, just go down that aisle, get what you know you need, you'll be fine. That's a metaphor. I have, I'm an overnight oats guy, but anyways. Or experiment with other flavors. Know that you can always fall back on the cinnamon life. With PowerShell, I'm inviting you to taste something different, perhaps. Uh, don't let that distract or immobilize you from being creative and productive with the tools you already have. So I'm just going to tell my story about PowerShell, my own personal story with it. Let's talk about Windows for a little bit because that's where it started. My PowerShell story starts before PowerShell. In 2004, I stumbled into a job as an IT technician in a school, and responses included managing Windows servers. Years before that, I had been bitten by the Linux bug, and so I was already used to configuring everything with text files. Like everything about Linux can be configured with a text file and automating anything with Bash or with Python or maybe even back then a little Perl. So I came to the world of Windows servers itching to automate and the story was not good. <laughs> Bottom line, Windows had a miles wide product gap. It was very difficult and sometimes impossible to easily, repeatably, deterministically automate all the things. In fact, sometimes, this took so much time, I needed to resort to automating by sending mouse clicks or keyboard shortcuts to specific windows or buttons. Some of you have done this. Okay, Microsoft has always said, Windows has a shell, it's just a graphical shell, which looks pretty, but it's very difficult to automate. I'm not the only one who had complaints. This is Jeffrey Snover, the inventor of PowerShell, talking about how he came to Microsoft. When Microsoft reached out to me, I said, no. What do you mean, no? Well, I don't want to talk to you. Well, why not? Because your software is rubbish. I probably didn't need to censor in this context, but I do like the word rubbish, so we're going to just use that. Because your software is rubbish, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to work with rubbish software. It's an embarrassment. That's how he came to Microsoft. They basically were like, OK, but we need you. So, and he liked that idea and came in. Um, I'm not trying to be down on Microsoft, not, not because Microsoft's awesome, but because that's, I don't feel like that's where my energy needs to go. Um, but I, I, I do think some uh, realism about the difficulty of launching PowerShell at Microsoft is, for me, refreshing because if you're like me, you've been in companies, even the companies you love, that sometimes their worst, the worst enemy of a good product for your customer is often the systemic idiosyncrasies or systemic dysfunction of your company. And that, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in that kind of story, there's actually a biography about PowerShell, by the way. So if you like to read about promising technologies being birthed in dysfunctional organizations, you might find this book interesting. Or if you're like me and just like reading historical nonfiction about command line shells, this one's for you. <laughs> so my first encounter with PowerShell was 12 years later. Font big enough? Ugh, hardly. Sorry. Not sure I can do a whole lot about that. But, uh, it was 12 years later as an IT director in another, in another school. It was a Windows Active Directory environment. Sometimes I just didn't want to fire up a bloated GUI application to do a thing, or I wanted more control. Then I found this thing called PowerShell that had moved in to fill that Windows automation gap that I had noticed earlier. So I used commands on occasion like get AD user and get AD computer and other assorted Active Directory commands to query and update users and computers just right there on the command line, and occasionally in short scripts, I treated it like a helpful toy, which it is. At that time, we had far more Linux servers than we had Windows servers, though, and so I started to use Ansible. That's a very popular configuration management tool. And lo and behold, Ansible had some support, even quite a bit more now, for Windows, for configuring Windows servers. For Linux, BSD, and Mac and the like, Ansible uses Python under the hood. For Windows, Ansible uses PowerShell under the hood. So I thought maybe this PowerShell thing wasn't just a joke. And that was one of my first moments of maybe PowerShell deserves a deeper look. So I soon found myself turning to PowerShell more and more often to interact and automate. And that's a starting place for many, many PowerShell users, right? They are strung out IT people who are just trying to get a handle on things. And PowerShell is much bigger than that as I'll find out later, but if you do a casual web search, most of your results are gonna be that exact category, the strung out IT, the desperate Windows administrator in dire need of real control and automation and feeling like they might have finally found an oasis. So here's a use case for you or someone you know. Maybe you have a friend who could use a little more automation. Maybe it's your IT director, maybe you are in IT or whatever. Some of what they need to automate is Windows. 
they might not think they can write code, and they start writing code because they want to make their system administration just a little easier. And PowerShell could be that gentle on-ramp for writing computer programs to make life better and to automate. In addition, I recognize this is probably controversial, there are people who might not pick up Bash, this thing that started decades ago and has slowly uh, accrued things over time, that if you're in the know and you've been using Unixy things for decades, uh, great, Bash is probably for you, but maybe it's intimidating to some personalities. They might just pick up PowerShell, a more freshly designed shell language. Same argument could be made for Python or Ruby as a system um, configuration language, or a newer shell like Fish or New Shell, et cetera, of course. All right, that gentle on-ramp. A couple things I noticed about PowerShell right from the beginning, it was comprehensive, so for Windows at least, all the levers were available. Unlike earlier experiences where you could do some automation, but for real control you had to open up a window and grip the mouse, PowerShell commands covered like every feature, and sometimes even more than what the UI covered. So there's also this ease with which one can learn PowerShell because its design is fairly elegant and deliberate. Here's an example. So for the way commands are named, a PowerShell command is called a commandlet. That is a silly name. But it's great for targeted web searchers because web searches because no other shell calls them commandlets. If you search for commandlet, you're going to find PowerShell stuff. Commandlets follow a naming convention of verb noun. So do this to that, like import CSV, add content, get process, out file, and yes, out is not just a preposition or a noun, it is a verb. Uh, for instance, get help is one. So you can use get help to access documentation. Power, PowerShell has a ton of very verbose and very discoverable documentation built in, and it's updatable. You update the documentation, say, once a week because they're always updating it, and they don't want to release it on Patch Tuesday or whatever they're calling it now. So anyways, note that if you launch PowerShell for the first time, your documentation is going to be a little thin. You can run update help to fill this out, and here's some other examples of how you might search. But it's, it's all there, kept up by well-paid Microsoft employees. You can also just find stuff online. You can, it's, it's fairly well structured. If you're more of a book person, here's one that I'm working through now, Learn PowerShell in a Month of Lunches. This, um, I find that I'm learning something new in every chapter, even though I have a programming background, but it's designed to be hospitable for those who have no programming experience. So this is the kind of thing, again, if you have a friend or you're in IT and you're feeling a little underconfident or they're feeling a little underconfident in programming, this would be a great book. Uh, maybe you have lunch with them or something. Um, PowerShell is, like everything Microsoft, very backwards compatible. So PowerShell videos about PowerShell 3 are still very relevant to PowerShell. We're at 7 now. Um, here's if someone likes more of a, a slow, and these are like, these are really, really long. Like this is like, these will take a couple days for you, to, for you to get through, but I'd, I'd recommend those. There's a free uh, e-book e that Microsoft has published online. But like every computer programming language, if you come from some background and just want to drink from the higher fire hose, use learn X and Y minutes. There's one for PowerShell. There's probably one for any other language you want to learn. How do you market a shell? I don't know. I'm not sure that Microsoft knows either, but here it is. So PowerShell is intended to be easy to learn for Windows admins who may have little experience with coding or command line. I love this line, those who don't automate are doomed to repeat themselves. That's great. It's very true. And it's true to the PowerShell community. Um, PowerShell is not so much trying to compete, like I feel like the community and the marketing, it's not trying to compete with other shells. It's trying to compete with the practice that is rampant. Some of you can probably attest to this is rampant among Windows admin culture, and that is let's just click through all our problems. So PowerShell's trying to compete with that, trying to offer an automation avenue. Something else they try to market is now, uh, is that it's open source and it's cross-platform. Let's talk about that, because that's another attraction for me. When PowerShell was open sourced and com can be compiled on various platforms, I was pleasantly surprised. It makes it a lot more flexible. It also makes another use case possible. Say you want to share a shell script and trust that it's going to work on a variety of platforms. Um, I often find myself in a software shop where I'm the only Linux person. So if I'm surrounded by Mac people and I want to share a script, I'll make sure it works in Z shell or bash or whatever run times I can count on. Like if everyone has Python or everyone has Node, I'll just write it in that. If you're surrounded by Windows people or even have some Windows people, PowerShell might be a great choice. They can just run it. PowerShell 5.1 is baked in to Windows 10 and 11. They don't even need to install it. Um, and I can still develop it on the OS of choice. So I 
often write my PowerShell scripts on Linux and then share it with Windows users. It's open source, both the docs and the actual thing. It accepts PRs. I'm currently working on a PR, but I'm not getting very far yet, on uh, better PowerShell integration with the Wayland clipboard. Uh, it's easy to install on a variety of platforms. You can even run it in Docker. Um, it varies by distribution, the uh, how to install it, but all the instructions are there, or you can figure it out on your distribution of choice. Also has great editor support. Uh, VS Code and PowerShell are a match made in heaven, but I enjoy writing PowerShell in NeoVim. Uh, any editor with, LS, with language server protocol support should be able to work with PowerShell editor services, which is the language server for it. Another use case, maybe you or an accomplice needs to accomplish a specific task for which PowerShell, being very extensible, has a relevant and well-maintained module or script. Here's a bunch of popular ones. Import Excel is a very popular uh, PowerShell, and I'd say PowerShell might be better at Excel manipulation than some other languages, dare I say. So I mean, the, uh, also, if you are an Azure, uh, you know, if you interface with, with Microsoft Azure, uh, Azure integration, I mean, Azure, um, PowerShell is a first class citizen in terms of interfacing with Azure. Microsoft keeps those modules up to date. I've been, I, um, for me, the hospitality of a language community is almost as important as the syntax and features of the language itself. I think one of the reasons I write Rust is because like, you go on Reddit and say, I wrote Hello World in Rust, and the whole Rust community is like, you're a genius. You know, that, it's that kind of hospitality. I feel like PowerShell for me has, has been very, very similar. Uh, very impressively welcoming and helpful. Uh, the Discord and the Slack, they're bridged, so it feels to me like they're exactly the same. You see the same chats in both, but those are very active. There's a community blog. The Reddit's active. There's a PowerShell.org. Um, there's also some, these are a couple YouTube channels if you're interested. And there's even a PowerShell podcast. Even if you don't like PowerShell, it's actually a very entertaining podcast. Okay. Finally, here I'm ending with what I regard as some just attractive language features in PowerShell. So that's probably what's caused me to warm up to PowerShell more than anything. So I thought I would write a not very necessary tool in front of your very eyes. As we go, I'll highlight some bits of the language that I've found attractive. So let's build a command line Wikipedia search client. Oh, how bad is this? Are we able to see it? Are we doing all right? Okay, all right. Invoke web request is a built-in PowerShell command line. It functions a little bit like curl or wget, if you are familiar with those command line HTTP clients. Here we give it an API URL for Wikipedia, asking it to, and the reason I use Wikipedia is because you don't have to have an API key, you just, it's public, so. Anyways, here we give it an API URL for Wikipedia, ask it to return a list of articles that link to the article on computer shells. And you might expect it to return a JSON response body, which it kinda does, but it returns an object. So not just text. So in this output on the left, we see the property names. On the right, we see their values, such as headers, content length, and so on. So this content property, though, that we see there, that looks like it has the desired JSON response. So how do we get just that? Okay. One way to do that is to encapsulate the whole command in parentheses. So now we consider which property we want to pull out. I believe it was called content. So we add content. This should give us just the content body, and there it is, the resulting blob of good old JSON. This uh, is, for me, something that made PowerShell a little offensive, right? But in the long term, it keeps drawing me in. While it can handle text input like you would expect a shell to and text output, its native inputs and outputs are usually in object form, like you just saw. We'll see more how the object-oriented nature of the outputs is both weird and helpful. So let's evolve this script by introducing variables for flexibility and readability. Okay, let's take a look at what we've done. Query and limit are now their own variables. We interpolate those variables in a string. It's really this simple. Just stick the, the variables always start with a dollar sign in PowerShell. You just stick them in the string. Our response then is a variable as well. Note that the response is still just raw JSON text. Let's parse that JSON so we can better reference the values in it, so we'll just say here's the body. We'll convert it from JSON. In PowerShell, there's a lot of built-in converters. So convert from JSON is one we're using here. The body should now look like an object, which it is. It has a single property, pages. 
So for what we're doing, there's a more relevant PowerShell commandlet than invoke web request. It's called invoke rest method. This is built in and has a lot of built-in features useful for calling out to the HTTP API, to various HTTP APIs. So let's replace invoke web request with invoke rest method. There. As soon as we do so, we no longer need to handle the raw output and convert it from JSON. Invoke rest method does that for us so we can make this simpler. That removes some lines. But while we're at it, we can just output the content of the pages properly. We saw it had the JSON blob that comes back from Wikipedia just has a pages property, so let's just bring that out. And there we have it, a list of Wikipedia articles and their properties, just a reminder of what we asked for, a list of articles that link to the article on computer shells. How North Korea got in here is a bit of a mystery. The conspiracy theorists, I can hear what's in your heads, North Korea and Microsoft Windows. I knew it, I knew it. All right, <laughs> so we'll take care of that later. Back to, uh, there's apparently a North Korea Linux distribution. That's why it's in there. So I, I didn't know that called red something, but anyways, you can look it up. <laughs> Back to objects. Okay, because you can pass objects on the input and output streams, you can pipe objects to and from commandlets. Say we want something different than the list format we saw earlier with properties on the left and values on the right. Thankfully, there's formatting commandlets available. So to format as a table, we can pipe to the format table commandlet. Boom, now it's in a table form. Here's the result, it's fairly readable. For each entry in the pages array, there is a row in the table. Uh, the commandlet get member is something you, re, I use frequently in PowerShell because it lists all the properties and methods of a given object. Ah, here we see, again, this is just the pages thing we got back from the API. Uh, we can see various methods as well as um, all the properties, so description, excerpt, ID, and, and so on, and, and the methods. So this particular method here looks interesting, get type. Let's try that, pages get type. All right, so it's an array of objects. Not a big surprise. So an array of objects can be piped to other interesting commandlets, such as convert to HTML. Again, built in. We haven't even, we're not installing third party things here. Convert to HTML normally produces a full HTML page with the head and body, with the fragment parameter. We can get just the table in this case and select just the properties we want. So we uh, saw some properties that we discovered earlier. Let's just get key, title, and description, and here's our output. Hey. Let's see that in the browser for the sake of prettiness. And there, PowerShell just produced a little HTML table in one line. So, well, yeah, one line. So as you can begin to tell, this is not a minimalist shell, right? It's like a cross between a shell that does shell things and a kitchen sink included programming language like Python or Go that have robust standard libraries. Uh, as a bit of a Pythonista, I'm used to that. I like it and it made it easier for me to warm up to PowerShell. Without installing a single external module, there's already a whole lot of things available. I assume that in 20 or 30 years, PowerShell people will be trying to figure out how to deprecate pieces that are antiquated and irrelevant and getting all kinds of community criticism for it. It comes with the kitchen sink approach, I suppose. I don't know if you follow some of the bizarre things that Python's having a hard time shedding that no one uses anymore, but apparently one person does and then there's a big. <laughs> so, okay, a couple other piping operations. Let's narrow it down to the most relevant results so I'm just gonna say select object, last four. Give me the last four. It's a little bit like a tail, kind of, but it's on an object. So goodbye, North Korea. Now let's sort it by the key property. That will output the, well, then let's output the pages, uh, but let's just show the title of each page. Note that there's, here right, right away you see there's a convenient way of selecting a property from each element in an array. You don't need to do a verbose iteration. Um, there we have it. And you probably are asking, what ordering does sort object, the commandlet sort object use? Well, as you can see here, it always sorts by reverse order of operating system superiority. Right. <laughs> and here's the fun of shell scripting. Okay, up until this point, we may have tried some things from the command prompt, built the pipeline out a bit, and now we can take those same commands and build it out as a script to be reused later. So these lines you see can be saved to a file and run and rerun with PowerShell. That's how shells work. We try things on the command prompt and then well, I better save this to a file so I can use it later. But let's polish this thing and make it a legit PowerShell commandlet with parameters, help, and so on. This is gonna go fast, fire hose, but hopefully it'll be somewhat entertaining. Let's make it a function. We'll name it using PowerShell's verb noun convention. Find is an approved verb, so no, let's not call it that. Let's call it enter rabbit hole because Wikipedia, while it seems benign, will suck you in 
to hours long click spirals. So enter rabbit hole it is. Next we parameterize the query just by uh, making query and limit parameters rather than hard coding those values. Let's set a default limit of five on, so in case the user doesn't specify one, it can be five. Then we can specify types to add a bit of validation. So now the query must be a string and the limit must be an integer. While we're at it, let's make the query mandatory. That means if the user leaves it out, they will actually be prompted to input it. And of course, it'd be nice if the query could be piped in, not just like on the command, like not put it after as a parameter. So all we have to do is put value from pipeline. Now you could pipe the query from something else. That's all we need for that. Let's add some help text in case the user wants to know more about what the query's for. Once we change the syntax a bit on the title selection, then we can use select object to get the title property. Add a calculated property, in this case the URL, which is what you kind of want if you're searching Wikipedia, built out from the article key. We're almost there. Let's add in some documentation. Honestly, you could leave an empty synopsis and it would try to infer a bunch of documentation, but I added a bunch of you know, examples, description, a link, all that. Let's include uh, comment-based definitions for each parameter. Uh, and I'm sure this has been bothering some of you. We really need to URL encode the input. It's easy to do. It actually points to an entire world that's now opening in front of us because that URI, URI class that we see there um, that, I, that I just did with the escape data string, um, that's a .NET class. So not only does PowerShell bring its own kitchen sink, it has available this giant library of functionality called .NET. So PowerShell can access .NET classes and functions. So let's summarize what we've just done to make this commandlet our own. We made it a function. We added parameters. We used the kitchen sink, such as the very powerful invoke rest method commandlet. We dipped into .NET as needed. We used the pipeline for cleaning and sorting. We added comment-based help. That's our script. Let's see if it works. All right, let's check out the help first. And there we have it. Okay, we've got explanation of parameters. We have an example, related links. It's all there because we put it right in line documentation. Let's try piping a query and limit it to eight. Hey, that worked well. Let's try, this time we'll filter out North Korea right away. There we go. Hey, we didn't enter anything, but it prompts us for the query. What did we ask it, oh, what? Oh, please enter Wikipedia search query, okay. Langster PA, that's it. Okay, any questions? That's my whole presentation. Thank you. We put all of that stuff in a PS1 file. Now, when you type enter dash rabbit hole, does it just know to look for an enter dash rabbit hole PS1 file? Yeah, why aren't you observant? You did the, you brought the thing I did behind the scenes. So I installed that and it's gonna, it's platform specific, but you, um, I should have included the command I used and I'm, I would have to search my shell history for that. But there's, there's a path. And as long as you, you, you would rename it not PS1, but PSM1, I believe, PowerShell module, and then stick that in the path and then it's there. And what's cool is you can, Im you can um, like import it, like bring it in, but PowerShell, if it's in that path, if you use it, it will automatically import it. So it's just trying to make things as easy as possible. Good question. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, well, nothing's quite the same, but there, yeah, so, I mean, there was actually quite a brouhaha at Microsoft about it, and something slipped through the crack. There was gonna be a whole bunch of streams, but they basically ended up with st standard out, they don't call it, it's just output, and there's error. Um, those are the two I use, so you can easily divert error to one file and divert output to another if you uh, want. Is there clean pass through, or are they using like, like, yeah, that is an, object and under the hood it's XML so like yeah I was just dealing with this because the error output you can have an XML or you can have it in plain text um, cool. yeah similar. yeah it's it's similar like if you're used to Unix standard in standard out standard error it feel it feels familiar enough but the, again that's that object oriented thing so you might have to select what fields you want and, and that kind of thing yeah, other kind of questions or, 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 or comments. I don't have any way to launch microsatellites with PowerShell. I wish I did, because that would be really cool. Um, but maybe there's other interesting things that you're thinking about or, or want to ask. 
or engage. Yeah. Does PowerShell suffer a little bit on that because it's cross-platform or not really? So I use it on Linux. It doesn't, yeah, so it's like, it's like Python 3 versus 2. You've got the Windows PowerShell 5.1 that's built into Windows. It's all there. And now they've moved ahead, right, to PowerShell Core or I don't know what they're calling now, but PowerShell 7, which is really slick and cross-platform and works everywhere. So the suffering is that your friend's PowerShell might not be the PowerShell you have on your Mac. You might have something that's better. Like invoke rest method has way more functionality on your Mac than it does on someone's Windows unless they upgrade, you know, unless they install PowerShell core side by side with Windows PowerShell. It's a, it's, it's a little confusing. I wish, this is my biggest complaint, is when will Microsoft just bake in PowerShell 7 into Windows so that I don't, to me, the, one of the big attractions for PowerShell is I can give someone a PowerShell script who's using Windows and they don't have to install anything. Because, yeah, I mean, a lot, just reality is a lot of the people, my Windows friends who I'm working with, um, they don't necessarily have Python or another runtime that I'm used to, but they do have PowerShell and it can do extract, extract transform, transform load operations, it can do database stuff, it can do, I mean, it can, it's a full-fledged uh, programming language. The, the other piece that I notice suffering is just, it just takes a, a blink or two to launch the interpreter, so it's no different than I would compare it, no, it's, it's not as fast as Python launching. It's, it's a beast, it has, a, it, so, you're not waiting, you're not twiddling your thumbs, you're just kind of like, why did that take an extra second? Well, it's because it launched the interpreter. So if you're already in PowerShell, it feels fast. If you're in Bash and launching a PowerShell script, or you're in Z Shell launching a PowerShell script, it's gonna take a heartbeat longer than if you were executing a Bash script, if that makes sense. So that, those are the dings that I notice the most often. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, so the, the, oh my word, I'm just, <laughs> what do they call a cheese shop now? The, uh, the, um, the Python um, packaging repository, what, pip, 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 whatever it is, yeah. You know, the equivalent is the PowerShell gallery. And so if you want something to be really distributable, you just get an account and, and, and upload it to the PowerShell gallery, then someone can just install it using import module. <coughs> So import module will be similar to pip install, uh, you know, in Python land. So you can like lock versions and like, you, could you tell this, this PowerShell script will only run on these versions? I'm, I'm assuming you can do all that. Yeah, like when I'm searching PowerShell gallery, I can, it's a little confusing to me because like if I limit it to just Linux and Mac, it'll exclude modules that I know run on Linux and Mac. So I don't always know, maybe it's up to the author to, to publish that or to categorize that correctly. Um, yeah, but the, when when you are importing modules, it will and it'll have several. You could have several modules in parallel with different versions, and be able to choose which one you want to use in this script. So there's some flexibility there. You could probably tell, right? PowerShell is new enough. It's just looking at every other language, trying to learn from every other language's mistakes. So the proverbial standing on the shoulders of giants. That's they were just basically the the. the People who designed PowerShell were very familiar with a wide variety of languages and they wanted, Jeffrey Snover, for instance, came from Unix background and what's the other, uh, what's Plan 9? No, it wasn't Plan 9. But it was some other operating system that, you know, he learned some things, so pipelines and, and things like that were from the Unix world. PowerShell is Unixy in that regard. Um, I don't know why I got on that rabbit trail. Uh, oh, yeah, so, it's, it's gonna behave a lot like other package managers and have some of the same issues of, I don't know, I don't know how well they vet the PowerShell gallery in terms of malware and all that, but that's, that's everyone's problem. So, thanks folks. Sorry, I took a little more extra time here. Satellite guy isn't here, correct? No. Okay. So, uh, turns out he is homesick. Ah. Yeah, thank you, folks.